you finally touch American soil. Well, we've seen the power of Statue of Liberty. We got on our knees, baby. Really? You were grateful. Better believe it. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. Suffering podcast. podcast. At podcast. what point did you guys take your helmets off and just <sighs> take a deep breath? At the fourth day. Then after that, we started on the move. No kidding. Did you encounter any? Don't forget, I, I, one thing I'd like to explain. Before. This is back in 1943, yeah? And we st- had radar at that time. Believe me, we had a fuse finder on our, on our gun. That radar would send information down to the gun, and the guy would crank the, put the shell in, crank it, and set the fuse. Okay. In 1943 now. Now, on that fourth day when you had time to take that deep breath, you're sitting around with all the other guys. What were, like, the conversations like? What's next? But was it like holy shit? What did we just go through? Yeah, yeah. Where the next? hell? Where the hell are we gonna go from here? <laughs> now we 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 in in law enforcement we use humor, you know, to break the tension. To break the tension. Was yeah. there any like jokes going around that were like everybody's too serious? Yeah, you know, everybody's looking at their own, looking for their own self. You know, yeah. I should say looking at your own ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A lot of sleeping going on that fourth day. <laughs> better believe it. Did you encounter any of the German prisoners? Or didn't you take any prisoners? We've seen some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. That's I it. guess the Treaty of Versailles didn't need much that, <laughs> at that point. You're so mad from what the hell just happened. Yeah. Where did you go after, after Utah Beach? Right, right on St. Low area. And we followed the infantry. And our any aircraft gun. That's aircraft at night, artillery in the daytime. They would call us, and if they needed help ground wise, we would fire artillery. Okay. This was all in communication type. How far did you make it inland? Did you did you it, actually? It, but it, the first day was about three quarters of a mile, I think. Yeah. Somewhere, that's somewhere right there. And and how much resistance in France did you encounter? Not too, not too much right then, but the second day, yes. Yeah. Now, I bet you the, the citizens who you did see in France were pretty oh, darn happy to see you. You better believe it. Yeah. That's when you get the girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the worst we, we, part, we. let me tell you the story there. Going on the beach wasn't bad. It, it, we had a, a job to do, and we done it. Everybody t- took off and what the, where the officers told us to go. But in the meantime... The nights before, gliders had been coming in. No and engines, can't hear anything. You can't hear anything. And these poor guys, didn't get it, even on the ground, they hung in the trees. And the first experience was to see one of these gliders pilots walking down the road with his eye out. With his eye out? And he was doing, going like this. No kidding. And he was... It was it was pitiful, really. You know, all alone, all alone. He didn't know where the hell he was yeah. going. But, uh, wow, that's sad. He done his job. It's yep. amazing how many people did their job and you know paid the price for afterwards. So you make it in. How far inland did be, once you're in and you're encountering resistance and you're fighting war? You're fighting what a traditional war is thought to be. Boy, the Fast as the infantry progressed, we would follow it. Now, did you make it? Did you ever make it into Germany? No, no. Uh, Thirty kilometers from Germany. Thirty kilometers. So you were right there at the forefront. Yeah. Seen some of the Russians. Oh, yeah, you did. Yeah. Okay. They had four or five wristwatches on their arm, and they didn't know what time it was. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you trust the Rus- Russians back then? No, no. Trust nobody. Trust nobody. The war. At what point did you know the war was coming to an end? That your time there in the, Europe. Was, the speed we were going. Yeah. When the speed picked up, you know, things were starting to. Oh, I could tell you some stories. You know, I was broke twice. From a T5. Yeah. And this is in the Rhine River area where the winery is, okay? <laughs> so we spent a couple of days in, in the winery. <laughs> and. Uh, we, we had a little time to, for ourselves. 
So we, I took a walk, me and another fellow, and walked out on the road, and there was a nice German BMW laid along the road. Oh, I thought, boy, we got to get that sucker going. We did. <laughs> and I didn't anymore get on of it, start down the road, and two star general come across me. <laughs> Boom, I lost my stripes right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'd have had a chance at it, I'd run him for. <laughs> so, Chris, the worst thing you can give a soldier is idle time. Idle hey. time is the devil's playground. Yeah, yeah, I'd it. say that all the time. That's same thing in police work. Yep. You know, idle time is always the worst. So the war ends. You go home. We had to talk a little bit about. We were in Battle of the Bulge too. You know. I did not understand. I did not know you were in the Battle of the Bulge. Yes, indeed. Because they broke our outfit up. Uh, the 90 millimeter gun crews alone, four in, them, four in each battery. And our job was to go at intersections in the Belgium. And our AP shell was the only thing to hit, stop a German tank, but it had to be hit in the right place. So Armageddon. most of us had intersections we had to cover. Now, that's the first time I was really scared. That's the first time you were scared. Really scared. How, how long into this was it after you, after you hit the beach? It, how long was this? Oh, this is uh, six or seven months you know, wow. for, after the boats pulled out. So there's a, there's a great scene in Band of Brothers, which I'm sure you've seen. I'm sure, I'm sure you've watched. It's probably very difficult for you to watch, bringing back so many memories. But there's a great scene where they're walking through a farce. These, the, the 82nd Airborne had been through the Battle of the Bulge, and they... they they, I think they do the battle some justice from what the vets were talking about who were there. And they're walking through this forest in Austria or something. And, and they say, uh, wow, this just looks, this look, I forget what battle, particular battle in the Battle of the Bulge was or conflict. And he says, wow, this reminds me of that forest that we were, we were fighting. And he goes, yeah, it does, except the trees aren't exploding. There was a tree standing. Yeah. If it wasn't maybe four or five foot high. It just. You know? uh, and our gun crew was separate from we. We I had to full t drive the tra tractor, so we had to stay away from the gun. So we would stay about a quarter of a mile away from. the need to get out in a hurry, but that's the first time I was really scared. At at night, the Germans had come down and chill, right along the hedgerows. Cripes, they were getting that, that close, and I thought, boy, that's it. Because it was so cold, you couldn't dig a foxhole. You had to lay on top of the ground and cover yourself up with snow. That's guys. Wow. I know got a lot crazy. of guys lost a lot of appendages from frostbite. Not oh, you bullet. better believe it. Yeah, but we were equipped for that. Yeah, I don't think you're. There's certain cold in this world that you're never actually. No matter how much you prepare, no matter how much equipment you have, there's certain cold that it just bite you. I tell you, yeah, and we couldn't run our equipment because it was short of the gas. I used to run the, the full track, and the exhaust was about like this size, and we'd get nice and warm, <laughs> sucking in all those fumes, yeah. and being happy to do it. it was dead, right, didn't bother you a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Lighting your cigarettes off the uh, off the exhaust pipe. So now, now when when this whole thing, when you finally find out it's over, like how would you how were you notified that? It's over. It's done. We're heading back home. Well, how we were notified, we started to break up the, our equipment, and our, we were transferred from an artillery to an engineering department that were being deployed. So that's that. Then that's the time we knew we some, something was going on. We didn't know where we were going yeah. to get back home, but it was over. How great was that trip? Trip back home. Terrible. It was terrible. You know you're going home and, and Italian troop ship. <laughs> Eighteen days. That's because Italians can't build anything right. You know that, Mr. Gibson. Here we go. Hey, Eighteen days, and you talk about people being sick. Oh, yeah. There wasn't a sick guy that could eat, <laughs> even their own sailors. Well, that's that's how they saved on food. <laughs> I was able to look out the hatch one of that. I got acquainted with a couple of guys there. Hey, they opened the hatch up. I looked at the, the waves were above the boat. Wow. And this thing was, the rivers were starting to pop out of the bulkhead. And that's when I had a lot of equipment I was going to bring home. 
<laughs> but I threw it overboard. <laughs> no. Oh, no. So at the bottom of the ocean, somewhere in the mid-Atlantic, there's some very valuable World War II memorabilia. You better believe it. You better. <laughs> I mean, on this Italian boat, they didn't give you like veal parmesan and pasta and all that. I mean, it wasn't. No, it wasn't anything like that. Well, just think, you make it through all that, the invasion of Normandy, and you're thinking you're going to die coming back home on a ship. <laughs> on a ship. Imagine yeah. that. He didn't know whether he was good damn thing he was going to make it back or not. You finally touch American soil. Well, we've seen the power of Statue of Liberty. We got on our knees, baby. Really? You were grateful. Better believe it. Gratitude. Gratitude for what you left behind. Gratitude for what you're coming home for. And a Absolutely. sense of accomplishment. Is I, it like a sense of accomplishment? Like we really did something good? Right. Yeah. That's. What, what was the welcome like when you got back to the States? Oh, it was great. Was it great? It wasn't like Vietnam where they were spitting on the soldiers and Hanoi Han Jane no. and no, we had a great reception. Any woman you want? I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Lined up. Not, I saw the picture of the sailor kit in Times Square. I'm not telling any more stories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, he's an 18, I, 18 year I, old I got guy. a short one to tell you. At this time now that the war was over, okay, we were 30 kilometers from Jersey. From Berlin, and we had nothing to do, so we go out wandering again. And I ran into an old Mercedes. I didn't know what it was. Pretty well beat up, so we tried to get it going. Damn, if we didn't get it going, we got caught again. <laughs> again, <laughs> the lesson there is: don't try to steal yeah. a German BMW. <laughs> right, right. The lesson is: don't get caught. Don't yeah, get don't caught. get caught. Don't get caught. Mr. Gibson, so you, you finally touch American soil, and you've seen you were at the D-Day invasion. You were at the Battle of the Bulge. You were you admittedly scared at the Battle of the Bulge. You went through all this crap. Let me tell you the first start. We first went in. We went in at Camp Dix, okay? Mm -hmm. Camp Dix had nothing but tents at that time. With pot belly stoves in the center to keep warm, what did I get? I got fire watch the first night. <laughs> <laughs> you must have. That's because you stole the BMW. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> why. Stole a two sword general's BMW. That's what happened. They said, watch out for this. Just <laughs> At what point did what you went through start to set in mentally? Because, again, I have this understanding of war. I've never been to war. But war is war. Okay. And I know it had to, it had to affect you up here. It did. How did you it deal did. with it? Well, it got to the point where you, you you didn't like trust anybody at that point, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Was there ever any? Uh, of course, you go to bed at night and you you hear bing 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 bing. Yeah. So a lot of right, yeah. a lot of post traumatic stress or, right. or what they called it was, back in the day, shell the, shock. Shell shock. But the and, thing of it is, you had to do something. You had to get that your mind off of. Yeah. So you went to work as soon as you could, and I did, and that helped out. Because, you know, your generation dealt with post-traumatic stress much differently than our generation deals with it. And yeah. I think there's some lessons to be learned for how you, because you didn't have the, the resources that we have available now. You know, if you told anybody, I'm, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, please. If you went to tell anybody, say, hey, look, I'm, I'm a little screwy in the head. Like something, something's not right here. You'd probably get looked at a little funny. Yeah, yeah, right. So you had to eat it. And you went to work, and that's how you got through it. Was did it ever rear its head in any unhealthy ways for you? No, but I, I worked with other GIs that had been the Navy and Army personnel that helped out. Mm -hmm. We worked together. You, you, were, had, you were the American version of the Band of Brothers. You had, you had people to talk to and talk right, about. Right. right. That's like how I know Bob through my VFW. Right. You know. I mean. All of us, we meet once a month. We put on, uh, you know, different events at the VFW. And, you know, it, it's a camaraderie that I, I know personally it helps me. And I know it helps Mr. Mr. Gibson. So Bob, you, I get that Mr. Gibson. I have to be Mr. Gibson. You can call him Bob. That's that's the way it is. But you, you've, you've shared blood yeah. on foreign soil, even though you were in two different conflicts and two different wars. A thousand percent. We were talking on the ride up here and we started talking about the differences, you know, from World War II to, you know, when I deployed in Iraq and whatnot. And it, it's, it's different, but it's the same. The one thing I'll say about you, Mr. Gibson, is what you went through landing on that beach, none of us will ever 
see again in American history. That will never happen again. It'll all be push button. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So you went through, sir, living history. And I'm so grateful for you. I'm so grateful I'm, for I'm proud I've done it. I'm proud I'm proud to have you sitting across the table from me where I'm able to have this discussion and it's it's an education for me to sit down there. Cause I, like I said, I've I, I told you earlier that I've known some people who were at the D-Day invasion, but I was too young too stupid or maybe too afraid to ask them certain questions about the way they felt. Yeah. And that's why you sitting here is so important to me. Uh, now we're coming to the end of this thing here and you've seen suffering on a level that most people cannot imagine. Couldn't even fathom. Can you tell us what you've learned from it? I to take care of myself. And help other people as much as you can. I love it. And don't forget, the old boy upstairs has... He's, he has a final call. He's got the final say. <laughs> exactly. And I thank him every night. Well, listen, I want to thank you every night. You and everybody that was over there because it's because of you and, and people like you that made this country as great as it is. And I truly appreciate... I had chills the whole time just sitting here looking at you and speaking to you it is an absolute honor well this is the way that people treated you in france incidentally i went over the may the 31st and come back to eat for the and anniversary of the, the 70, invasion here. 78th anniversary really and how was that going back what was it like for you to go back to france everything's changed 78 do, years do you see it's the, I, I know the craters are still there yeah some of the pillboxes are still there. When you stepped on that beach, did it? Did you have some flashes of water? Oh yeah. yeah. And the tide was coming in the same time it was when we landed. Around two or three in the afternoon. Now your accommodations to get there were probably a lot better this time around. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but you in a you, nice you jet. would never seen a celebration like they had on D Day. It was fantastic. I. I you're a dying breed, sir. You're a dying breed. We need to hear these stories. We need to continue to remember these stories um, in, so that we can never forget some of the bravery that the young men and sacrifice that the young men of this country and women nowadays are putting up. They're, they're giving them themselves. Listen, we had the women in our days, too, you know. Yes, I do. I do. They might not have picked up a rifle, but they were... They were just as valuable. I went in the field hospital in Aachen. I got caught in a barbed wire fence. And I went into that place, and you would not believe the care that was given. But these fellows were just, I can't, I can't explain. I was going to say, some of the things that these women had to see also, had to put they, up they saw the worst of the worst. There's guys in their legs off and hollering, and I couldn't take it. I had a well, I'm certainly. I'm I got a band aid and I left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly glad you're sitting here today, Chris. This is living history right here. I agree. I'm, like I said, I've had chills the whole time. Mr. Gibson, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for everything. I appreciate you too. And, and, and thank you for all you've done. Thank you for all you continue to do. And thank you for coming in here and sharing your story with us. It was, it's heartfelt. I appreciate it. Really it. I appreciate it. Are you a cigar smoker? <laughs> you are okay. One of our we're gonna we're gonna give you a, a nice Belladama cigar. She's one of our sponsors. It's Chantel's one of our greatest supporters. Um, she's one of two female cigar owners in the country. <laughs> uh, she she's wonderful. And if you go to belladamacigars.com, put in the suffering ten, you get a ten percent discount. But we're gonna send you home with a couple of them today. Okay. Once again, thank you so much. And thank you. That's gonna do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast, the Suffering of D Day. And let's think about all the stuff that we learned today. Perspective, that one simple word. War is war, no matter what time, no matter what age. Sometimes you just have to, you have a job to do, and you just do it. Bite the bullet. Literally Hit and figuratively sometimes. <laughs> Hitler was a shithead. <laughs> <laughs> Gratitude and honor. That's one of the biggest lessons that I've taken from you today. Absolutely. But most importantly, take care of yourself and take care of those around you. Absolutely. That's going to do it for this episode of the Suffering Podcast, the Suffering of D-Day. 
Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Follow Mike at Mike underscore Felice. Follow me at Real Kevin Donaldson. And follow the Suffering Podcast. Don't forget to look out for Best Defense Foundation, taking care of the ones that take care of us, these men and women, the service that they gave this country we can never repay. And we will see you on the next episode. Have a good night.